Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. They seriously expected you to work with them after that negotiation? But before we begin, best way to support our channel is to leave comments, like, and subscribe with the turned on bell so you don't miss the new video every single day. Here we go. Bad coworker thought she could push the manager around. I have a troublesome coworker that thinks she can push the store around. She constantly tries to change her schedule so she can get hours that she wants, even though it makes things harder for the store. Let's just call her Stacy. And she has a history of doing this over the past year. Well, this year, Stacy decided to tell the boss that she couldn't open the store anymore and that she was only available from eight in the morning till three in the afternoon. Furthermore, she tried to blame other employees for things that she didn't get done. Last year, she decided to cause an issue with another employee, and that employee turned her in for food stamp fraud. To give you a little background, Stacy lives with her boyfriend, and he happens to work for a government contractor, making over $20 an hour plus overtime. Her boyfriend went out of the way to buy her a brand new car to go back and forth to work. In this regard, Stacy lied to social services by not telling them that he lived in that household. After the report was filed, Stacy came into the store to buy groceries, However, she paid in cash, which prompted me to ask her why she didn't use her EBT card. She told me that somebody turned her in and that her EBT card was shut off. In order to get her benefits back, she moved out and reapplied for food stamps. Once she was approved and got her benefits back, she broke her lease and moved back in with her boyfriend. Fast forward to this year. Our store was having attendance and cooperation issues. As a result, there was a store meeting where corporate got involved and every store employee had to be present. During the meeting, they stated that all the applications for the current employees had an availability for any day and any shift. In order to rectify the problems that our store had been having, corporate decided that all employees will get scheduled for different shifts, including opening and closing. Stacy decided that she didn't like that and over the weekend decided to send a message over Facebook stating that the schedule had better be changed. Stacy threatened the assistant manager by saying she's not working nights and she would not be coming in those shifts. I received a phone call from the store manager saying that Stacy had called out for her shift today and that I'd have to cover it. Keep in mind, I already had plans to go out to dinner for my birthday with my parents. While I don't mind the overtime, I'm not happy that I had to cancel my reservation and blow off my family. As a result, I made a call to the social services office in my county and made a report that Stacy's committing EBT fraud. Moreover, if they check the address they have on file for her, they'll find that she's no longer living there and that the owner of the property will be able to verify that she broke her lease. This will be the second time that they'll catch her lying to them about her living situation, being that this will be more than one instance where she lied in order to receive benefits, it's very likely she'll be charged with welfare fraud. So now maybe she'll be looking at more days off and spending that time in a cell waiting to be arraigned. And our second story. I turned off a radio station. In the 90s, I was a technical operator for a radio station. Long story short, I made production elements for them and adverts on top of my other duties. New management came in and decided to only pay me for the tech op shifts I'd done and nothing for the production. First month he was there, I had an invoice for a little over 3,000 pounds and received a 960 pound check. I ran the overnight, so when midnight came, I moved all my production into a hidden folder in the system, shut down the servers, threw the breakers, and left. I got a phone call in the morning and was asked to come in for a meeting as I'd left them up the creek. I'd made pretty much 70 to 80% of all the adverts and production, stingers, idents, montages, the new boss was a jerk. He told me I'd damaged the product, which I just laughed at as before it came in, it was a great 80 station and he turned it into a top 40 station that you could find up and down the dial. But call him Jay. I also found out that the sales staff was charging customers 200 pounds for advert production. They were on a 10% commission and I was getting 40 pounds for each advert and they pocketed the rest on top of their commission. Bear in mind the rest of the outsourced ads cost 150 to 200 pounds. In the meeting, I laid out my demands. Me. I can restore everything, but I don't only want the money you owe me from the past month. I want the money from the previous adverts your sales staff has pocketed from my work. They essentially made an extra 160 pounds from each advert on top of their commission, 
Around three or four hundred pounds a pop. J. There's no way we can do that. Me. Well, there's no way I can restore the adverts. J. Looking at the pieces of paper on his desk, we can give you an extra two hundred pounds a month. Me. I want the whole amount. I handed him an invoice that totaled a little over sixteen thousand pounds. The color drained from Jay's face. We, we, me, Jay. You honor that invoice or you will have to recreate or outsource all of the production. Okay, let me see what I can do. I'll sort something out for your next invoice date. Jay, if I don't walk out of here with the money today, you don't get them back. Jay, as soon as you restore them, I'll see what I can do. Me, Jay. I will have no guarantees and I'm not stupid. A bank transfer today and we can sort this out right here and now. Jay then phones the head office and within the hour I have every penny of it in my account. His face was a picture when he followed me to the server to watch me move the files over from one folder to the other. Me. Yep, they were right under your nose. Jay, through gritted teeth, you best get home and get some sleep. Now, good luck tonight. Within five hours, I was in Spain, and I stayed there for four weeks. When I got back, I did hear through the grapevine that the sales team was out for blood. Jay bullocked and blamed them for me being ripped off, and they all lost their commissions for three months and just got base pay to make up for the loss. I'm pretty sure the company made more than enough back from that to pay for my hostage negotiation. I used some of what was left to buy a laptop and started DJing around town for a few years, back when it was a rare sight and used to get nerdy types on a night out just hanging around the booths to see what I was doing with a computer in a pub. My friend used to say I looked like I was doing my homework. And our next story for you. Repeatedly block my car in private parking? Good luck finding and getting your car out. I live in an apartment building which has end-to-end -end parking for two spaces per apartment, and access to the parking levels, one through five, are done via a locked automatic roller door, which people can only get through if they have a remote for it, or sneak through behind someone else. I only have a single car, and sometimes I let my friends park in the space in front of my car if they give me notice, so I generally park at the back of the double space, plus it's easier for my neighbors who have two cars. Earlier this year, a random car began parking in front of mine on Friday afternoons, meaning I couldn't go out with my car on Friday nights. Annoying, but not the biggest issue when you live super close to the city. This continued nearly every week for about five weeks when I didn't park my car at the front of the bay, which I began doing. But times I planned to leave the space free for friends coming over or whatever, the car appeared again. I made repeated attempts to stop this behavior by leaving notes, which escalated into leaving printouts of a photo of the car with the license plates clearly visible and an explanation that if it happened again, I'd press charges and or have the vehicle towed. Well, it happened again. And this time, it was still there Saturday afternoon when I'd been planning on going away with a group of my mates. My guess is someone went out on Friday, got drunk, and decided to pick up the car later, not concerning themselves with the inconvenience it caused anyone else. It clearly hadn't moved. It clearly hadn't moved, as my aggressive note telling them to F off was still there sitting limply under their wiper blades. I figured enough was enough. It was time to have the vehicle towed, so I called building management and eventually called a towing company, who refused to help because the space was on the third floor and they can't get any trucks up to that level because of the height and space restrictions. Ordinarily, most people would be screwed at this point, and I'll admit I briefly considered sitting on the hood of the car until the jackass came to pick it up while sending my mates on their way without me. But they would have had to work out a new arrangement for transport, as one car wouldn't have cut it. Fortunately for me, my parents only live 30 minutes away and have a garage where I work on one of my cars that's getting at the tail end of a minor restoration. One of the things I use pretty often is a set of vehicle positioning jacks to jam my project car up against the wall of the garage to minimize the space it takes up. For anyone that doesn't know, vehicle positioning jacks are basically devices that slot under each wheel, then lift the car up on hydraulics so you can freewheel it in any direction. While I hadn't originally gone to retrieve them, when I had to take my project car off them, a bright idea popped into my head. None of my mates minded spending an extra hour to screw someone over that had interfered with us, so we grabbed the jacks and went back, propped the car up, and wheeled it out. Six guys can easily move around a small hatchback, so we pushed across the level slowly 
and carefully to an area where there isn't parking but is a load supporting pillar with space enough for a car behind it in a little section of the garage where it isn't lit and is completely out of the way. Typically, there's a guy on my level that parks a motorbike there, but he isn't supposed to, and I doubted if he'd mind. We dumped it between the pillar and the wall with the nose pointing towards the wall, and I took back my angry note, the jacks, and we left to enjoy our weekend. When he came back Monday afternoon after the long weekend, the car was still there, which was no real surprise considering there was only about a foot of space for movement between the pillar and the car and another foot or so between the car and the wall. From the fact that the front wheels had changed, we're guessing they did try to get it out unsuccessfully. It eventually went later in the week, though I'm not exactly sure how they managed it. I never saw the car again. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video to the end, and I'll see you in the next one.